fucking good. All you'll ever be. <laughs> if a film franchise goes on long enough, it will inevitably wind up in space. Whether it's 80s horror icons like Jason and Pinhead suiting up for the void, or Tej and Roman taking their fast and furious antics out of the atmosphere for reasons, there's just something about outer space that is irresistible to tentpole filmmakers looking for the next big spectacle to toss to an increasingly ravenous audience. Though the trend does predate them, most of the blame for its ubiquity can be placed firmly on the shoulders of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg whose one-two punch of Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind had the major Hollywood studios scrambling to cash in on the science fiction craze. United Artists and producer Albert Cubby Broccoli, who were reeling from a massive success of their own following 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me, had the idea to give a sci-fi spin to the James Bond franchise. And even though The Spy Who Loved Me ended with a promise that the next film would be for your eyes only, they immediately began production on a different Bond film, one that would take their world-famous British secret agent out of this world. James Bond is back, and bigger than ever. After a space shuttle is hijacked en route to England, 007 is tasked with uncovering the thieves. His mission takes him from the floating city of Venice to the wild jungles of Brazil in pursuit of the evil Hugo Drax, the wealthy industrialist who built the Moonraker shuttle and who has a nefarious plan so shocking in its scope that Bond will have to leave the comfort of the Earth's surface to stop it. I know what you're thinking. You're wondering why I'm getting into James Bond when I normally just talk about sci-fi movies. Well, for one thing, Moonraker is an important science fiction landmark, but for another, I've been desperately trying to find a way to squeeze in some of my thoughts about James Bond in general, which you'll have to wait just a few more minutes for. First, let's talk about the production. For inspiration, Broccoli, who did in fact pronounce his name like the vegetable, turned to the as-yet untapped potential of the third of Ian Fleming's James Bond novels. Moonraker, the book, is about a secret Nazi industrialist who tries to use an experimental defense missile to nuke London in retaliation for World War II. Even though Fleming had written the story specifically for it to be made into a movie, Moonraker didn't get to the screen in the first ten Bond films because the plot was relatively thin and the setting never leaves Britain. Therefore, when adapting it for the 11th movie in the series, they took the name of the villain, Hugo Drax, and not much else, before coming up with a brand new story that climaxes with Bond in space. Broccoli was determined to lend realism to the space sequences, and so he contacted NASA, who were in the midst of realizing the very first space shuttle launch. NASA was more than happy to help in the making of Moonraker, so they worked with screenwriter Christopher Wood and other filmmakers, eagerly sharing an incredible number of details about the shuttle and about real life in outer space. The film was even scheduled to release shortly after the premiere launch of the space shuttle Columbia, but significant delays with the STS-1 mission ultimately meant that Moonraker would beat the shuttle program to space by nearly two years. Even though Steven Spielberg had met Broccoli at the release of Close Encounters of the Third Kind and said he wanted to direct a James Bond film, the job of directing Moonraker went to Lewis Gilbert, who had previously directed two other Bond films, You Only Live Twice and The Spy Who Loved Me. Roger Moore's original three-picture deal with Eon Productions to play James Bond had been fulfilled, but he agreed to play the part again and would continue to do so on a negotiated film-by-film -film basis. Nobody else was seriously considered for Moonraker, and by all reports, Moore's asking price was more than fair, and he wasn't shy about his enthusiasm for the part. The villain, Hugo Drax, was originally going to be played by James Mason, but when the base of production moved from London to Paris to take advantage of significant tax breaks, 
The terms of the Anglo-French Film Treaty at the time stipulated that more French performers would need to be in significant roles. Therefore, after briefly considering Louis Jordan, who would go on to appear in Octopussy, the role of the big bad actually went to Michel Lonsdale, best known at the time for the Day of the Jackal. Learning that Drax could have been played by James Mason makes me genuinely upset, because I really don't like Lonsdale's performance in the film. It seems he is trying to undersell the role instead of hemming it up the way previous Bond baddies had, but he just takes it too far. Lonsdale's Drax comes across as a bored charisma vacuum, not the kind of character who could inspire a cult-like following. You defy all my attempts to plan an amusing death for you. Mason would have been so much better, and I challenge anyone to argue otherwise. As for the female lead of Dr. Holly Goodhead, a supposed NASA technician who is actually a CIA plant, they hired Lois Childs, who had previously been offered the role of Soviet agent Anya Amasova in The Spy Who Loved Me. Coincidentally, she was seated next to director Louis Gilbert on an airplane flight, and he decided during the trip that she was perfect for the part of Dr. Goodhead. Well, Mr. Bond, I guess we'd better get started. Unlike Lonsdale's Drax, I love Child's performance as one of the more strong-willed and capable Bond girls. In fact, if you look at the story just the right way, Dr. Goodhead is the real hero of the piece, with Bond acting more like a spectator to her takedown of Drax. And Lois Childs absolutely sells it, easily standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Roger Moore. Due to positive fan reaction to him in the previous film, Richard Keel was brought back to play the role of Jaws, and this time, he was softened and given a redemption arc. He was even allowed to speak in the end. Well, here's to us. Even though wearing the metal mouthpiece was incredibly uncomfortable, Keel enjoyed working on the Bond films, and he remains the most beloved and recognizable henchman in the entire Bond canon. The other henchman in Moonraker, Chang, is played by Toshiro Suga, who got the part by being the Aikido instructor of the film's executive producer, Michael G. Wilson. Wilson himself cameos twice in the film, and there's another fun cameo from effects man John Evans. Desmond Llewellyn and Lois Maxwell return as Q and Miss Moneypenny, respectively, and Bernard Lee reprises the role of M for what would unfortunately be the last time before his death from stomach cancer in 1981. It's activated by nerve impulses from the wrist muscles. Like this? Oh, thank you, While we're stopped, I just want to quickly remind you to hit that like button, and if you really do like this video, hit that subscribe as well. Your support really makes this channel possible, so please, if you like what I'm doing and you want to see more, consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. If you want to see even more from me, I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heap and From Here to Paternity, which are available wherever you get your podcasts, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emcgill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. Principal photography began in August of 1978 in Paris, where three competing French film studios, whose names I don't want to pronounce, pooled their resources to provide enough sound stages and material for the production. The recognizable set of M's office was moved in pieces to France, while most of the model work was still done back at Pinewood in London. In Paris, they took advantage of a few different locations, including the Pompidou Center, the Chateau de Volovico, and a plaster mine that honestly looks more like a constructed set than some of the actual sets. Those sets, including the centrifuge, Drax's Aztec base, and the spectacular space station interior, were crafted by production designer Ken Adam, who had not only worked on nearly all the previous Bond films, but was well known for building the War Room set while serving as Stanley Kubrick's production designer on Dr. Strangelove. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the War Room! Location shooting was also done in Venice, most notably at the film-friendly Piazza San Marco, the Hotel Daniele, and the Monastery of San Nicolo Alido, as well as in South America, 
including at the Iguazu Falls at the border between Argentina and Brazil, at the Tikal Ruins in Guatemala, and of course at Rio de Janeiro. Nearly a year before arriving in Rio, a second unit team filmed B-roll of the actual Rio Carnival, which had to be painstakingly recreated for the first unit. The principal photography in Rio was nearly delayed when Roger Moore had to take a few days off to recover in hospital from severe kidney stones, but they managed to rearrange the schedule to avoid too much inconvenience. They even used a shot of Moore arriving by Concord when he finally made it to the country. The fact that Concord offered direct flights between Paris and Brazil was actually one of the reasons they chose it as one of the film's main locations. How do you kill five hours in Rio if you don't samba? Another problem cropped up in Rio when it turned out the person they had paid for use of the cable car was the son of the owner and not the owner himself. And so when the owner returned from a trip, he demanded more money to sanction further filming at his place of business. The second unit was also responsible for the wide shots of the opening skydive sequence, in which the stunt crew undertook 88 separate jumps over California to catch all the action. California was also used for the helicopter trip Bond takes to the Moonraker facility. One of the other big action scenes, the riverboat chase, was filmed primarily in Port St. Lucie, Florida, where both the camera operators and the editor had to take great care to avoid showing the houses that are visible just out of frame. Meanwhile, back in London, Derek Meddings was in charge of the models and miniatures, including the space shuttles and Drax's space station, the latter of which was built at the famous 007 stage in Pinewood. Due to time constraints, they couldn't use photographic compositing, which forced them to do everything in camera over multiple passes, with one shot reportedly needing a total of 90. Though this was certainly a more difficult process, it's amazing how little fidelity is lost in the final cut, even when viewed today in HD. While I wouldn't say it's perfect, for example these space marines are coming out from behind the shuttle rather than from within it, I think it holds up better over time and just looks cleaner than your standard late 70s compositing, Star Wars notwithstanding. The music was composed and conducted by Bond staple John Barry, who had also moved out to Paris for the job. The title track was originally offered to Frank Sinatra, Johnny Mathis, and Kate Bush, but all three eventually declined for various reasons. Bush had to pull out very late in the process, leaving Barry only a few weeks to find a replacement before the movie was set to release. Thus, he turned to Shirley Bassey, who had also done the vocals for Goldfinger and Diamonds Are Forever. She was unhappy with the lack of time to make the song her own, but she did the song, and though the melody is good, Moonraker is one of the most forgettable title tracks in the entire James Bond catalog. While we're on the subject of music, I do like how the film nods to its inspirations with just a handful of easily recognized notes. Moonraker released in June of 1979 to mixed critical reviews and an enormous box office haul of over $210 million against a budget of $34 million, making it the highest grossing Bond film until Goldeneye a decade and a half later. Despite this success, it has earned a reputation over the years of being one of the goofiest and most easily satirized films in the series, but that might be just a little bit unfair given that both A View to a Kill and Die Another Day exist. Time to face gravity. Still, it paved the way for more Roger Moore James Bond films, including the previously promised For Your Eyes Only, a movie I personally enjoy a lot more. Now, before I get into my opinion of Moonraker specifically, let me take a minute to talk about James Bond movies in general. I'm dipping my toes into an enormous franchise here, so I think disclaimers are warranted so you know where I'm coming from. I grew up watching James Bond, starting from when I was far too young to understand what I was even seeing, and as such, I absolutely love each and every film in the franchise. This never happened to the other fella. 
albeit with varying degrees of enthusiasm. I can acknowledge that these films take a surrealist approach to reality and reflect an escapist fantasy that should never be taken too seriously. From the very beginning with Dr. No and his dragon, these movies have always been at least a little silly, but my favorite Bond films have always been the more grounded, serious, and gritty of the bunch. Movies like From Russia With Love, License to Kill, and Casino Royale. The gun is fired, boss. Yes, we're still working on that one. It should therefore come as no surprise when I say that the Roger Moore era, despite being the era I grew up in, contains my least favorite stretch of movies. So, that disclaimed, I can now say that Moonraker represents a lot of the things I dislike about that era of Bond, most of which have to do with its strict adherence to the Goldfinger formula. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die! And I get it. Because Moonraker was such a high-budget movie, they weren't about to take a big risk and make broad changes to that formula. You could argue that the more films did start Bond on the path to changing with the times, especially in regards to how the stories treat women, and Moonraker is certainly a good example of that as well. Let me help you. Still, the writer in me just can't look past the lack of narrative logic. Most of the action scenes happen in the movie just because the formula says that there needs to be one every so often, regardless of whether or not there's a good plot reason for it. Look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. It may be funny to see a spy pop out of a floating casket to throw a knife at Bond, but only if you aren't busy wondering why the bad guys would bother with such a ridiculous setup, why the assassin would attack the boat driver before the actual target, how they knew Bond would be at that exact place at that exact time, why they didn't foresee the boat being too tall for the footbridge ahead of it, etc. And that's just one example. At some point, the writing just stops trying to make a workable plot and shrugs off any inconveniences with an implicit, eh, it's a Bond movie, what can you do? I know that works for a lot of people, and that's fine. But it doesn't work for me. And this movie is filled to the brim with moments like that, immediately followed by a trademark Bond pun and a Roger Moore smirk. I know this is designed to encourage the audience to have fun and not think too hard about it, but whenever that happens on screen, it almost feels like the movie is making fun of me for caring about the story being told. Five, Bang on time. Four. So, having said all that, why do I still love Moonraker? Mostly because, at the end of the day, those silly action scenes really are fun, and narrative concerns aside, it is clear that the filmmakers took their jobs seriously. The Oscar-nominated effects are fantastic, the sets are incredible, the cinematography is gorgeous, the models are cool, the other models are nice to look at, the stunts are impressive, the efforts to inject some sense of realism to the more fantastic elements of the plot are more than welcome, and seeing Jaws get a happy ending will always bring a smile to my face. I've heard it said that Moonraker is a good Bond film until it goes to space, but I actually don't agree that the space sequences are what let it down. In fact, after all the space stuff I've seen from classic sci-fi while doing these reviews, those scenes at the climax of Moonraker are refreshingly well done, and I don't mind them at all, with one big exception, the lasers. Once the action devolves into the pew-pew-pews of laser fire, my suspension of disbelief finally reaches its breaking point, leaving me shaking my head in embarrassment. It doesn't help that when I was watching the movie for the purposes of this review, that's the exact moment my wife walked in and asked, what are you watching? Even though I wasn't about to defend what was happening on the screen, what I should have replied is, I am watching a sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What's your favorite era of Bond and why? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for watching, and until next time when we'll head to a galaxy far, far away, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody.
007. My God, what's Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. 